This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 38 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Index Fund Advisors, IFA.com. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. And today we have an expert in gentling horses. We also have an author and an inventor of equine equipment. And, uh, and we also have a training tip from a lady from Guatemala. So we have a big show today. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thank you for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Glenn, with me today. How are you, Glenn? Good, Debbie. Hey, I got. A, I was so excited to talk to you today. I, was, I couldn't wait till we had to record again. Uh, yeah. You know, one of my, uh, I'd say the, the person I spend the second most amount of time with, yeah. is, beside my wife, is right. Jamie from the Horses in the Morning show. Because, you know, we're together three mornings a week and, you know, doing show prep and stuff like that. We're not actually together, but you know what I mean. We yeah, spend actually. time with each other. and <laughs> Coast to coast. <laughs> and we've become really good friends after 13, almost 1,300 episodes. Wow. Um, yeah. So, you know, I've gotten to know her really well. Well, she is so excited. She got this new, she got this uh Mustang from one of the prison programs. She bought it at an auction at a prison program. So, you know, she got to see the prisoner ride uh, this horse maybe for 10 minutes. So she was guessing, and then she was an auction. So the one she actually wanted, she didn't get. And she then, this was the second choice, and she ended up getting this one and taking it home. And it is, Thor is his name. And it has turned out to be a wonderful experience for her. But what's happened as a result of that is her realizing that she's only ever gotten rescue thoroughbreds before, and mm-hmm. Mustang's a whole new breed. It is. So she needed to learn a little bit more about that. Now, they do come from the prison program. They're they're at least, uh, you know, saddle-worthy at that point, and you can get on <laughs> them and not, not get killed. Right. You, yeah. Maybe. Um, <laughs> so she got home and realized she needed some additional instruction, and then I talked to her about Monty's program, and, and she came out and saw one of your things. Uh, right. with Monty and then she got on and she has been watching those videos uh, at the uh, university at Monty Roberts University nonstop online and boy they have been really working for her yeah well she has a smart horse too she does <laughs> yeah yeah no there I I know I love that they're in like little 10 minute bites so that she's so cute she she tells me I I, I watched this one I watched a couple of times and I went out to Thor and she can take it right on her phone too which is so cute and uh, and he picked it up and like it works which is so <laughs> fun it's so fun when you see all the light bulbs popping and going off you know it's 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 great stuff and he is so smart though I mean there is something about Mustangs surviving he was adopted off the blm then right for the prison system i would assume that it it would almost had to been i would think think so yeah Yeah. that's usually the way they do them anyway is they've got you know they do the roundups too and um they are you know they're the survivors out there Uh, you you take a thoroughbred out there and you say well gosh you know well some people do this actually they go let's put a really nice stallion out there with that wild herd because that'll really bring up the quality of oh no he dies you know i mean they they can't survive what some of these mustangs uh, you know generationally survive on out there it's just a really tough life so not only are they biologically physiologically tough they are um smart there's survivors that uh, you know avoid uh, death and mayhem at every corner those little guys from the time they're little foals they drop and they go you know so if they if for example one of the coolest things is if you go into a herd of mustangs they're completely silent you never hear them nicker you never hear them whinny you never unless they're on full flight or something you know but we it just around they think why are other horses so noisy don't they know the cougars will find them <laughs> right, exactly. when they do that you know shut up and already <laughs> yeah, that's right are you kidding me we're over here we don't want them to know that yeah so it, it is it that from survival mode um you know they're just they're like a deer that way you know they're just on a hundred percent survival mode all the time so um she but she got a particularly smart one i think too she did really well one. on that he's a big guy i mean he's, he's huge 
Huge. Yeah, yeah which yeah. for a Mustang, you don't usually. There was definitely some draft in there in his <laughs> past somewhere. She wants a to get carriage him, puller. In yeah, she wants to get him uh, uh, DNA'd so that she can see. And I she bet should. you that's what she's going to find. But one of the neat thing, what a couple of her videos kind of went viral, and you posted mm-hmm. them on Monty Roberts' Facebook page, and. You know, they were just simple videos about she was having trouble mounting him because he'd walk away. He was really not good at the whole mounting thing. And she watched his video, Monty's videos on the university and on mounting. Well, within what, two or three attempts after, you know, using what he said, she's there mounting him without him moving at all. And that's the video she posted. Yeah. Um, It was cool. yeah, the, you know, the, that's what I told Jamie um, when she was, when we went to Camp Verde in Arizona and we met her there, we, I said, do you know the, the number one um, reason for getting hurt on horses? And a lot of people think bucking or anything, but I think she got it actually. And that is uh, attempting to mount a horse. More accidents and more, uh, you know, problems occur during this. And most people don't take the time to do that. So um, we came up with just a really simple little lesson to do that. And she took it to heart. She's like, nah, I don't know. It, 20 minutes later, yeah, he was standing still. It helps to have that duly halter too. But, you know, it's, it's really about them figuring out that that's what we want. That's what I love is when you see the horse go, oh, that's what you wanted. Why didn't you say so? And I can do that. You know, I can come over to that mounting block because the mounting block gives kind of an anchoring thing. But there's lots of stuff in there like that, too. Um, she used the trailer loading lesson. Too, yes, she to did. Yep, that's students. right. Mm-hmm. And and there's some great tips to that, too. And that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know why other people haven't figured it out, but you just got to work with the nature of the horse. And, you know, when you figure out what helps them figure out what we want, then, you know, everything is really fast and easy after that. So that was, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Well, you have a new convert. And uh, where can, so if, if somebody listening wants to check out the videos, what do they do? Yeah, they should, they, should do, they should go on the day pass for free for sure because a lot of people go, I don't know if I can watch a video or not. But they, um, they go to MontyRobertsUniversity.com. So it's M-O-N-T-Y-R-O-B-E-R-T-S dot com. University. Sorry, I didn't spell that, did I? MontyRobertsUniversity.com. And then they'll see a big library page right there. And then it says join with a day pass. So they can jump on there for free for a day pass. You don't have to give up your credit card or anything. So big commercial for um, university. But you know what? It's really his mission statement. It's it's Monty's mission statement to share this stuff. It's cheap. It's uh, you know less than $10 a month. Uh, unlimited. And that's what Jamie's doing. She's watching it. Unlimited which is great. Uh, you know, you can watch 24-7 if you want to, back and forth, over and over again. And they have little challenge questions and things like that, too. But um, what I love is that she grabs her phone and just goes out to the, you know. Even if you don't have access to horses, it is kind of cool to learn about the nature of the horses. And, and like like we were, we're interviewing uh, Denise Heinlein today to talk a lot about the nature of a horse and, uh, you know, their, their phobias, their fears, and what they think of us and some of the social um, faux pas that we do with horses too. And we don't even know we're doing it. So there's a lot to learn. It's a lot of fun. But, you know, I don't think you ever stop learning because we're such different species. You know, we're such a carnivore and they're such flight animals. And I, I don't know that we'll ever have it all figured out. But that's part of the fun of it, I think, Glenn. Don't you? Yes, I agree. And I have something else, too. The Dooley well, Halter. Uh, we got one for for my pony, Scooter, who's about... 12 and a half, 13 hands. And Jennifer, sometime my wife, goes out for trail riding on her quarter horse and takes my hackney pony along and just ponies him along to give him exercise when I'm busy and can't get out with him a lot. Uh, she'll take him along. And it, also mentally, he loves to go on adventures. So <laughs> she, she takes him. Well, she always had a problem because he's a pony and he's a naughty little pony and he tries to get away with pulling and yanking and, you know, all the things ponies do <laughs> when you're going out, out on, uh, out on hacking adventures. Well, so, and so she, we got him a dually halter figuring that might help you know, with this problem. And she took him out yesterday for the first time. And she said it was so much better. She okay. said her arm is not 12 inches longer than the other one, <laughs> like all the other times. And she said it was so much better. Ah, good. That's yeah. great. You know? Uh, yeah. So now can you see, I mean, you test me on these things all the time. Can you tell me in like, you know, elevator speech, 
why that duly worked better for her, or do we need to get Jennifer? I on? think we need to get Jennifer on. I didn't okay, get the chance right. to talk to her too much, other than she wasn't whining and complaining like she usually did. When yeah, she good got enough. Home. Right there, stop right there. <laughs> so that's yeah, where the horse asked. husband. That's where the horse <laughs> husband stops the conversation and goes. That's yes. right. <laughs> so, <laughs> good enough. But there we'll definitely get her on to chat about that sometime, and she's going to be doing it uh, some more. So maybe we'll let her do it once or twice more, and uh, okay, yeah, so get back like, to yeah, us on it. We are expert. <laughs> but I just wanted to tell you, first test was good. Good. Okay. Well, it's worked for us for years, so I'm not surprised, but I'm really happy. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay. Well, um, I'm excited about our getting right into our instructors here, and uh, we've got two really good horsewomen coming up today, and I think we're going to have some fun. So we're going to have the head instructor of the Monty Roberts International Learning Center right after this commercial from IFA.com. Hi, I'm Mark Hebner, president of Index Fund Advisors and proud owner of Monty Roberts Willing Partners graduate, He's a Sugar Bear. <laughs> you know, investment portfolios are a lot like horses. You need to find one that best suits you, your temperament and your stage of life. Some people might like an energetic horse and an aggressive investment portfolio, while others are more comfortable with a gentle ride and a more conservative investment portfolio. The trick is to find the one that's right for you. That's what Index Fund Advisors is all about, matching people with portfolios, risk-appropriate, low-cost, and globally diversified investment portfolios. You can find the right portfolio for you by taking the risk capacity survey at ifa.com. That's IFA as an index fund advisors. Or you can call us toll free at 888-643-3133. That's 888-643-3133. Three one three three. Denise Heinlein has loved horses since she was five years old. She's traveled the world training horses, and she's finally settled in California as a specialist in teaching students to gentle horses and to help horses overcome some phobias and remedial issues, too. After teaching classes and courses in Germany and getting a lot of experience in the thoroughbred industry, she's now working and teaching at the Monty Roberts International Learning Center in California. Welcome, Denise Heinlein from the Monty Roberts International Learning Center. How are you today? Hello, Debbie. Thank you very much. I'm fine. Good. I know you're in the middle of teaching an advanced course right now, so I know we've got just a short while with you, but how's it going? Well, it's going very well. We are at the end of our three weeks advanced course. And it's always really, really nice to see how the students and the horses together did have um, this learning period, what they now kind of is unfortunately ending. But uh, yeah, it is super lovely to see like the progress they did in those yeah. two and a half weeks so far. Have they come a long way? Oh yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. They learned a lot. I mean, especially with those young horses and uh, some of the untouched horses, they will teach the students a lot. So we only have to guide and actually the horses will take over the, uh, the teaching for, <laughs> for the so students. You, you don't have to do that much. Ha ha ha. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you're you're helping in there, but you're right. The teachers are the best. So how many horses did this class end up working with that you have there? Uh, at the moment, we have, I think, um, seven starters. So each student, where um, they have their own project horse for those three weeks, so they can work with uh, their own starter. But at the meantime, we're going to rotate the horses for every uh, um, every session, so they have the possibility to work with as many different uh, characters of a horse as possible. But, yeah, we have seven starters and five untouched horses. Ooh, five untouched, too. So the starters may have had um, been handled some and have some halter training and things like that. So this is their first saddle up on them? Is that what they exactly. means? So they, they normally never had any tech on them. So mainly they are halter broke what we call that they be able to be uh, led around on a halter, but that that's it. I, I mean, most of them are young horses, so it's the first saddle and the first long lining what we do and some desensitization work and everything what uh, the students learn and also for the horses that they have uh, like um, 
a good start so for mm-hmm. their f- uh, future life. Mm-hmm. This isn't that Wild West uh, look like a Remington bronze where they're bucking and scared and all that. It's very quiet, yes? It is very quiet, but um, still it's more uh, for some, I mean, uh, bucking with the first settler is just a natural response. That's true. So uh, we uh, do prepare the horses as uh, by uh, step by step so that either the horse or the student uh, feel safe so they don't feel overwhelmed with kind of uh, the next task, what we ask them to do. But some bucking, yes, we get some bucking <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. with the first saddle because for the horses, it's just a natural thing. So they have something tied on to their back and uh, the natural response is like to try to get it off. But in that moment where they um, realize that there's nothing to worry about or it doesn't hurt or anything, they get through that stage pretty quickly mm-hmm. and then they accept it very well. That's nice. So I just was thinking, I'm putting myself in the student's position here, and and I can imagine somebody out there asking, oh my gosh, you mean I have to ride this horse on its first saddle going on? Is that what the students do? No, no, no. <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, we don't uh, ride the horses here because um, we don't know the levels of the students, and we are teaching mainly uh, the groundwork, so how you can prepare the horse for the first ride. Mm-hmm. But none of the students have to ride the horses or actually are not allowed to ride the horses Yeah, <laughs> to, to be safe. Yeah, that makes total sense. So you're learning basically the starting process. Now, I imagine, though, if you're a potential owner of a horse or you ever want to deal with a horse that's never been started before, knowing this process is probably a healthy thing anyway, even if you end up taking it to the trainers. Is that what people do sometimes? Is What do they do with this information? Well, uh, a lot of those students which are coming uh, to the advanced course, first of all, they have to uh, um, have the introductory course exam to be able to apply for the advanced course. So they have to go through the first level of education, what we offer here in the learning center or uh, all the instructors worldwide offer. So the Mm -hmm. first step, and then when they successfully um, that goes through the in introductory exams, then they can apply for the advanced exams. And so far, they have a, like a very much interest in the, in the work and they would like to see how they can further apply it to the horses and like how to teach the young horses. And yes, we have all different kinds of, some want to work in a, a professional field with horses in the uh, like in the future and some are just like um, very interested in horse behavior and want to learn as much as possible about the horses. Mm. So a lot of these people might go on to be either trainers or teachers even that's that's the advanced yeah so um, who, who takes the introductory courses then is that a broader type of student uh, people that are just yeah, the have introductory a course is open for everybody who is interested in learning Monty's concepts. So it's just a two-week course where it gets really in depth of uh, the principles we are working with. So the non-violence, the join-up, long-lining, uh, desensitization, and all those um, yeah methods. And it can be done uh, or ended uh, with the exam. And after this, most of the people, I have to say, because when you once get a glance of uh, how amazing it works with the horses and what kind of connection and uh, partnership you can create in that kind of um, method, then most of the people want to come and keep uh, working and keep uh, or try to understand even more about the horses. So that's yeah, why... It is. It's fascinating. We yeah. get a lot of the introductory students to follow up in the advanced course. Tell me more about the horses that, that this advanced course gets to work with then. So now you've got starters, about seven starters, I think you said. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the, the wild horses, the, the horses that are brought in for gentling? The wild horses, are, all the horses or most of the horses, let's say it like this, what we are working with at the learning center are from rescue places or equine rescue centers and we cooperate with them so if we have different classes coming i'll contact uh, the rescue centers and ask if they have the right 
horse for the course, so like the starting horses, young horses who are, who are halter broke but not settled or nothing worked with, or if they have any horses they can't touch or get close to them, then, then I can say, please, can you bring those two because then we can help mm. you to uh, put the first halter on and the first leading and grooming and what's also very important to kind of get the normal care done mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. for the hoof and everything because it's not natural for the horse to like be uh, happy with picking up their feet and trimming and all that mm -hmm. so yeah we get them mainly from rescue centers that's great so they stay there about a month or something while these courses are going on and, and people get to work with them yeah exactly yeah yeah ah that's a wonderful relationship that you have with them that um I'm sure that they don't mind it as well. <laughs> the, no, and that would make them more problem. adoptable. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. That's cool. It's a um, win win situation for oh, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very good. And now I understand that you have um, developed one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today. You've developed a new course there that sounds fascinating. I, I'm fascinated because I know that it's harder and harder to find untouched horses or horses that really. Uh, are not, you know, raised up from the stalls and the and, and domesticated uh, as they are so much in Europe. I mean, you can't find the wild horses. So you've got this course. We've talked about it on the air before with uh, Jamie Jennings, who's a co-host of Horse, uh, Horse Radio Network, Horses in the Morning, and Monty Roberts. But you actually created the course. So I would love to hear what what your um, your thought process was to create something that you're not already doing there with the advanced course or the intro course. Tell me about that. Well, uh, I thought about it because, uh, in my opinion, like those horses, like the wild horses, they teach you actually the most. And they teach you so much about how uh, you have to be in control of your own uh, body, your own mind, and the breathing and everything. It brings you in the moment uh, right there, you know, because you cannot, uh, it's kind of almost a meditation state because you have to be so extremely um, observant with yourself because the horses, they will pick up everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty about those wild horses because they teach you exactly, for example, only the use of eyes. Our domestic horses, they are so desensitized uh, to uh, our human um, body movements that they don't really react to it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they've learned that it actually has nothing to uh, say or we don't we don't talk with our body to mm -hmm. them because they are just like, oh yeah, she's waving her hand. Um, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. So you're saying like, we like to look our horse in the eyes all dreamy and figure that he's you know, looking back at us with the same dreamy things. But in the horse language, that means something else, right? Yeah, exactly. So in the horse language, that actually means something. Uh, they don't like it. So because in that moment where you start having eye contact, normally like um, predators, they um, focus on their prey. So mm -hmm. if they if they start to, to focus or steer at like a horse, it means like almost that they did look at... Mm. Um, um, up for like their um, food, like their prey. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, and um, and for us, uh, like the eye contact, uh, we are not so aware of it. So because we think uh, it is like, or at least in our um, in our um, how is the word, mm -hmm. com com um, commu not community, but civilization. Uh huh. Or uh, in the, yeah, it's it's our our language within our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so eye contact means uh, it's quite polite. So you should uh, watch the other person in the eye to show that you are interested in. So we just uh, um, copy that uh, thought and like look our horses in the eye because it's so beautiful. But yes, for the horse, it's like actually not nice. It's like a lot of pressure. Mm. And that... wild horses mm -hmm. teach you that. So in that moment where you slit your eye up to the horse's eye, they go away. They they really respond to everything. They also respond if you don't re uh, work on your breathing and like your whole body is tense, they respond to it. Also, if you have your hand open or how you give them the first touch, if it's like with 
a tickling movement or if it's like a nice solid movement, they respond to it. And all our domesticated horses, they don't. I mean, maybe in the um, severe cases, yes, they show you a little bit of um, a reaction, but not as extreme as the white horses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think everybody who is um, interested in uh, like the yeah, horse business or mm -hmm. wants to work with business, they should have like the masters <laughs> teaching them, so, mm -hmm. which are the the white horses in the my opinion. Horses. Yeah. So yeah, in your in your uh, university, the the wild horses are the master instructors. They're the professors, right? And <laughs> they're the professors. Yeah. <laughs> They are. They're great teachers. And do you have anybody who really um, excels at this that surprises you? In other words, um, do the younger kids pick it up faster or a more mature person? Do they do they are they able to control their 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 biofeedback, if it were well, better? Actually, I, I, it's hard for me to say that because I think um, uh, that's a kind of a special talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody can learn it, of course. You can learn how to control your movements better and your breathing better, and you can definitely work on yourself. But to to really be um, good in it, I personally think it's it's a talent. It's given. a talent. It, it, so, so somebody can work on it, but if their physiology is, is more laid back or more um, quiet, it's easier for them? That talent? That uh, kind of talent? Uh, uh, well, hard to, uh, hard to explain. No, that kind of talent to to totally understand it. You know, I I go through and I I've seen all the students are getting uh, to the point where they like learn so much and develop so many like uh, good skills to uh, to be able to communicate with the horses. But then there are a few who are like talented in that kind mm -hmm. of way. You know, who will out of the rest who is also working hard. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if... No, I think everybody recognizes. Yeah. I, I think that's yeah. really true. We, we all know people that just seem to be so much more comfortable with animals, and it's not just a learned response. I mean, we, the cool thing is what I've seen you do is you actually can teach everybody to get to a pretty proficient level of that, even, even those that are a bit nervous around horses, right? Oh yeah, as more of course, as more uh, you learn about the horses, uh, the better you can understand, and the uh, less um, yeah afraid or like nervous mm -hmm. you are around because they get uh, predictable. Mm -hmm. If you if you be able to uh, read what they say, you can like respond to it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that helps a lot of students yeah to to calm down and really be uh, like more. Um, confident around the horses because they understand the horse just better. Yeah. Yeah. It totally makes sense. And, and do you, um, do you figure that this course this summer will be working more on that or are you just going to kind of leave them alone to work with the wild horses and figure it out for themselves? No, no. Are we going to like work always uh, in a guided way with the people. So if somebody, for example, comes in who has not that much experience with horses at all, they would probably be um, assisting more and maybe for the first touch and so, but will be not um, working with the horses by themselves. So okay. we're yeah. going to totally... Um, um, kind of like assess like the people. Uh -huh. Yeah, assess the people exactly, uh -huh. and then see what kind of levels they will bring, and uh, in in their level we're gonna like work uh, with the horses together. But still, it is so amazingly beautiful to see the learning curve what those wild horses uh, are going through. Mm -hmm. and so in the beginning, they are terrified uh, by um, humans. And yeah. they think that with the first touch, they will die. Yeah. And if you show them uh, in a nice, gentle way that uh, we don't uh, harm them and we are only uh, like teaching them step by step that they can understand what we would like them to do. And then their turnaround uh, is so amazing that I think it's like interesting for everybody, even if you don't have that much hands-on uh, experience yourself, which I, of course, try to implement as much as I can to keep mm -hmm. everybody safe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but still it has to be, uh, it has to be um, according to the skills. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, And we should note that, that you have that IFA gentling pin too, which makes it so safe with the shoots and the, and the small sand paddock and deep footing and really, really safe. So the whole setup is, it's done, it's perfectly made for this kind of courses. Yeah. You know, I was just, um, I was re re rereading some of the Temple Grandin, uh, materials and I'm, I'm hoping we get to speak with her as part of the instructors meetup in May, but when you were talking about eyes on eyes, if people think about autism, who um, people some people will not know who Temple Grandin is, but you should look her up. She is an amazing, uh, high functioning autistic who is very much a flight animal, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah I, I, and I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that she's she doesn't like to be looked at in the eye either, just like horses. So um, there are. I know that you were talking about it being a social thing that we've learned to look people in the eye, but not even all humans are that comfortable with eye contact. Yeah, exactly. So, and if you if you remember that kind of game, what you I don't know, we did play that when I was a kid. That uh, we did stare each other in the eye, and the one <laughs> and it gets really uncomfortable. I yeah. think if you have too long eye contact, you you try to really uh, you have to take it off because <laughs> it gets to the point where you cannot hold it anymore. I and forgot about that. To, That's right. Yeah, we used to challenge each other as kids to kind of who is stronger and who can uh, hold the eye contact longer. So, uh, yes, you're totally right. It is also not very comfortable like to have um, constant piercing eye contact uh, for the humans because normally, if you think about it, every human takes their eyes away even when you talk to each other like uh, regularly so you don't keep it's getting um yeah a little mm-hmm. bit yeah funny yeah that's, if you that's have funny. somebody who stares at you too long yeah that must be something in our dna way 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 back you know we all had that look from across the dinner table when our parents are yeah like, i think it's don't ever like do the that expression <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh, to because when you think about cats and dogs, when they start to focusing each other, that's yeah. mainly either they uh, there's one who takes the eyes off and like goes away, or it's it starts to get into a a fight. Yeah. So yeah, eye contact right. uh, in each uh, each individual, like each uh, um, species, it means like mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. very very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've all seen those birds that look at, at themselves in the mirrors and start pecking away, right? So, yeah, it's fighting words, I think. It's fighting, fighting looks, anyway. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, I look forward to hearing more about the, the July event and, and where do we find out about it? Can you give us some contact information? Yeah, you can find uh, out about it on uh, our website. It's joinup hyphen or uh, um, so join up hyphen up dot org uh, uh, yeah, or at Monty that. Roberts uh, uh, website. Okay. And you can also uh, write me an email at Denise at join hyphen up dot org. And it will be happening in July from the 6th to the 17th this year. Okay. And I hope that uh, like a lot of people will come in and um, yeah, experience this kind of course and since it's the first time uh, it's very exciting for me too to see how far we can get and um yeah if people like it as much as Mm -hmm. i think it will be brilliant (laughs) yeah (laughs) maybe i'm uh, like um thinking only for myself because i love it so much to work with these horses uh, I've seen I've seen a lot of people out there working in the gentling pen, and you know it's emotional even to see it these is. horses kind of just finally relax and and realize that you are um, going to partner with them and not kill them. <laughs> so it's yeah, really no, it's, it's a amazing. really cool thing to observe. Yeah, everybody. Should see. We we even have the the um, soldiers, the the ones that are suffering from stress disorders um, down there. You know, in a safe environment, uh, so you know that it's there's a therapeutic quality to it as well. It's fascinating. It too. Well, thank you, Denise Heinlein, for joining us today um, from the, the, the epicenter of uh, gentle horse training, which is the Monty Roberts International Learning Center. And I hope you'll um, join us again after that clinic and tell us about it. Yeah, I really wish that you give me uh, the possibility to talk about it and then let yeah, me share all the um, fantastic moments, which I'm pretty sure we will have. Mm-hmm. And yeah, 
So uh, it was a pleasure talking to you, and thank you very much for the interest in this Gentling Wild Horses course, uh, and I think it's going to be fantastic. We all hear about omega-3 and how important it is for your horse's nutrition, but why? Well, simply put, horses were created to get all of their nutrition from live, natural grasses. Omega-3 is an essential fat found in many types of live grasses, and it's critical to the horse's health. If they were living on live grasses 24-7, they would be receiving enough omega-3. But in today's world, most horses are fed commercial feed and forage as their primary nutrition, and most of these are lacking in omega-3. That's where Omega Fields comes in. All of Omega Fields' flax-based products provide a balanced essential profile of Omega-369 and may be helpful in alleviating problems related to skin, coat, hoof, joint, and sand colic. One of Omega Fields' terrific products is Omega Horse Shine. Omega Horse Shine is an Omega-3 stabilized ground flaxseed supplement for horses to help maintain a shiny, healthy coat, strong, solid hooves, and top performance for horses in all life stages. Omega Fields provides the best human-grade, non-GMO ground flax that can help horses with dry, scaly, itchy skin, joint pain and inflammation, poor hoof growth, allergies, and more. Don't just listen to Debbie and I. Alexandra, a customer of Omega Field, says any horse I ever own, I will feed them Omega Horse Shine, and I will recommend it to anyone. You can get your Omega Horse Shine today at OmegaFields.com, or just for our listeners, get 15% off using the coupon code MONTY2015. All one word, it's MONTY2015 for 15% off your next order at OmegaFields.com. That's OmegaFields.com. Carol Herter is president of Cavallo Horse and Rider, Inc. She's an author and an inventor, and she has a genuine passion to help educate horse owners. She goes travels all over the world doing that, and she she likes to speak on her belief that caring for horses' hooves naturally and keeping them barefoot is best. So she is a barefoot um, advocate, and she's designed and developed a whole range of Cavallo boots and even saddle pads, too, to, uh, to address the needs of the horse. I love her focus on that. In 2010, she won the Royal Bank of Canada Western Trailblazer Woman Entrepreneur Year. I don't know how they get all that on a trophy. <laughs> Woman Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Her background is in holistic and alternative health care, and she co-authored a book called The Barefoot Trim, The Cavallo barefoot trim and she you know, you'll see her articles in various publications and she and her husband Greg live in beautiful Vancouver BC and if I was a horse I would want to be owned by Carol Herder. Welcome back Carol Herder. I'm so happy to have you back on this show. How are you? I'm very well Debbie enjoying the spring here in British Columbia. It's, oh, the sun's shining, the sky's blue. I'm so grateful that the riding season is about to kick off again. Yes, it is. It's almost May. It's getting really close to that. We've just had our Easter, and now everybody is pulling out the the gear and washing the old boots off and everything and getting ready to go. And Vancouver is gorgeous this time of year. I'm sure everybody's just sighing because there's a lot of cold spots still left. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. So yeah. I wanted to talk today hey. about, we, we had so much fun last time talking to you and I know you've gone to a million places. I would love to hear about all the, I think the last time we talked, you had just got back from the, um, from Africa and yeah. you had done a beautiful tour of that. And I know you've been to all kinds of spots since then. We talked about, about the road to the horse. Yeah, I, and yeah. I was there and she was there and we never met up. I can't believe that. Clint. I know. I saw her husband. Clint was hiding from me. I was. I was hiding. Actually, we were in watching most of the time. It was mm-hmm. so much fun. We just had yeah, to watch. Fun. Yeah, yeah, pretty exciting show. Yeah, it, it, it's so great that that's such a big event these days too. You know, I mean, twenty years ago, who would have thought? You know, watching uh, young horses be started, we thought that had to happen behind the barn somewhere with a trainer and everything. And now these guys are out there showing everything they got, and they're talented, huh? Yeah, and these fans are rabid. Yeah, <laughs> and you know who's really Carol talented are the horses. Those beautiful uh, young baby horses who just want to do the best they can. You know, so providing some understanding and some comfort, uh, they're just willing. You know, they're so curious. They're like little babies. They want to know what's going on and how to please. 
Yeah, and how to please. Yeah, they want to be your partner. They're so generous, yeah. aren't they? If we think about yeah. it, how crazy these environments that we put them in and, and they just put up with us. Yeah. yeah, give and give and give some more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're great teachers, though, too. You're absolutely right, Carol. So, and, and I know that Chris Cox just took everything uh, home on the winnings of that. But did sure you see did. some other talent coming in, too? Some young guys, gals? You know, honestly, uh, you know, it's funny you ask me that question because I look at the horses. I'm looking at these <laughs> horses. I know everybody's, you know, betting on the, on the performers, the people. But I'm looking at these horses and I'm thinking... They are such an opportunity for growth for us because they reflect what we give them. And so I guess in turn I am looking at the trainers too because I see how these horses are responding and I see how much that is a reflection of what's being uh, put out for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's you an know, opportunity that we have every single time we're involved with our horse. How they respond to us is what we is what we give them. We reflect. That's that mirror thing, too. They mirror what we're doing. You know, I'm sure this has been talked about, but I'm ignorant to it. Do they ever plan, like, a follow-up with these horses? Uh, like, this horse, you know, this is four years on from the road to the horse or whatever, and that we get to see how they do? I Does anybody know that, Glenn? Well, I yeah, mo- that. because most of the trainers end up keeping the horses, uh-huh. They are fans. I know exactly what those horses are up to. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, they follow them that way. You know, Mary Kitzmiller, who was one of the wild cards this year, does a show, does Horses in the Morning with me once a month. And she has a horse named Guthrie, and that's the one she trained up for the wild card competition. And she will never get rid of that horse. She loves oh. that horse. So that horse will be going everywhere with her. And a lot of these trainers end up taking them on the road with them for their circuit, for their, yep. you know, for their seminar circuits and stuff like that. Um, so these horses end up with jobs, you know, and they end yeah. up usually at the trainer's house. They usually end up well, keeping there you them. Go. Yeah. I think that's, that's the biggest, uh, story right there. Right. I mean, I know a lot of people say it's rushed or it's fast or they're young, but Hey, if they end up, uh, as happy, healthy horses, then there must be something okay happening out there. And those uh, trainers and horses are influencing such a generation at this point. And I don't think we can discount that. I think that's a really important element that's going on right now that everything is not done behind the barn anymore, but it's actually out in the, in the sunshine. You know, 20 years ago, trainers would not reveal their secrets, quote unquote, you couldn't get anything out of them and nor would they let you watch right exactly and you wouldn't want to watch in some cases too. right yeah. exactly <laughs> you know but True. You know, people would yeah. people it's would come getting home. so much kinder so much kinder it? and there's, it's all about a bond that's right and mm-hmm. i don't think trainers can hide from that anymore you know the ones that just say you know hey i'm the trainer here i don't i don't think they can do that anymore that's just old-fashioned anymore so it's good yeah. for the horses good so for the horses and good for the yeah. Boy, yeah. you know, you can you can you get videoed and you're on YouTube in no time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Of course they can doctor those too, so be careful with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but well, we're excited that uh, people are starting to see options out there, aren't we? Um, that sure, you sure. know There's that they so many options to be kinder, yeah. gentler, you know, more comfortable for us and our horses. Mm-hmm. You can take your time, or you can go fast. I, I think horses. You know, you talk about the mustangs out on the Nevada desert. They they don't get an opportunity to be slow out there. They're going to have to. You know, they learn to walk fast. They learn to run fast, and um, and they learn to survive. You know, by you, you don't get a second chance out there. So I well, think it's this, true. One of the beautiful things they do have out there, which they don't, aren't provided in um, a lot of domestic environments, is the herd, is the family. That's and right. um, that social interaction, that, that community life, just mm-hmm. breeds happiness hormones, you know? I mean, yes. they can survive a lot of things because they are and have and continue to carry on the herd mentality. That's right. That's, and it's, yeah, and we, we should be real careful about breaking that up too when we, when we do that. But, um, but I, I think you do see, I do see some of those adoptions coming off with really healthy horses and, and, uh, really happy horses. If they can go right into a situation where they're, they have a job and they, you know, they're brought up, uh, safely and sanely and gently. And, um, uh, Carol is related. She, she knows the story, Glenn, about, uh, dad, Monty, taking these Mustangs literally off 
the um, BLM in the Nevada desert uh, to dumped in a sand paddock. I mean, they were put on a, a stock trailer, um, dropped into a sand paddock at the farm in about July, late June, early July, and. By January 1, they were in the Rose Parade. I don't know if you know how big the Tournament of Roses Parade is um, on the West Coast, but it's, you know, it's millions of people. <laughs> it's a lot of viewers, and it's a lot of noise, um, mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of um, silly string, and a lot, <laughs> a lot of craziness out there. And, uh, and they're very picky about the horses that are allowed in the parade, too. Oh, it's true. They're vetted. There is a wonderful lady. We've had her on the show before, but her name is Ada Gates, and she is the farrier to the Rose Parade, um, official for like 25 years now. She lives in Pasadena, and uh, Dad had to get past her. Oh, yeah, because they want him to have shoes. Uh, they at, borium? Or they s- must have had a, made an exception for him because most they of did. them they require to have shoes with borium. You're right. That's right. That's right. So, I, you know, I, I, I can't advise it for all horses. And now we've got Carol Herter here, who is president of Cavallo Horse and Rider Boots. And there is a reason for that. But talk to me, Carol, about the person who would love to go barefoot, would love to pull the shoes and everything, but, you know, knows that not every environment they, they you know, they trail ride in or everything can be without shoes. So they're in this weird limbo land, aren't they? Well, I would say that horses can be without shoes in um, in every environment as long as they still have protection on their soles. And, um, you know, metal shoes actually don't provide sole protection. They provide protection around the hard area of the hoof, which is already hard, you know, the outside wall. So mm-hmm. it's really the sole that's compromised. And when there's an additional, uh, say, um, average 200 pounds is the average weight of most um, riders and tacks. So you, you put an additional 200 pounds, which translates to about 20% of the horse's body weight, on their back, it's pushing the sole even further into the terrain. So that's where you really need sole protection. And, of course, um, that comes in the form of boots. I get that most, a lot of the um, concern about taking the leap and, and pulling off the metal shoes and, and moving into a barefoot program is about, you know, how, how that's all going to be. I mean, you still want to ride your horse. You don't want your horse to be sore. You don't want to be limited. You don't want it cumbersome. You don't want to be losing your boots. Um, you know, sometimes it seems so daunting. And then you've got the addition of, you know, this farrier who's been very kind and attentive and, and maybe really doesn't agree with you wanting yeah. to go barefoot. Yeah, so it, it sets up a bit of, um, you know, a, a disparity. I mean, h- how do I do this? What kind of support am I going to get along the way? But I'm, I'm truly here to tell you how easy it is because we get testimonials all day long and we talk to people all day long. And one of the f- most fun parts of my job <laughs> is mm-hmm. that conversation that I have with the customer when she says, look, I really want to do this, but I'm really not sure. And yeah. maybe my clan isn't 100% behind me. So how do I do it? And, and I'm just so <laughs> grateful that I'm able to say, look, we can support you all the way through. And it's mm-hmm. not really difficult. You know, it's and not, you're huh? going to have a healthy, happier horse as a result. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but but how do you know without seeing their horse that those hooves are going to hold up to this? Is there a teasing that goes on to those hooves? Is there a transition time that you give them a roadmap to to get those hooves even hardened and and kind of over the holes in the hoof? Yeah. yeah. Well, here's the thing: like horses do come, you know, with a different sort of pathology and some of them have damage going on internally that's that's rather severe you know and Mm -hmm. some you know haven't been shod for very long or maybe they've only been shod part of the year so they still have this what we call hoof mechanism and hoof mechanism is when the weight of the horse descends the hoof is meant to expand and allow somewhere for that weight to go down and in so doing pump blood oh, yeah. and right. um, you may have heard it said you know that a horse has five hearts five hearts yeah has, yeah they're all heart and yeah. four on the ground and those four on the ground are the frogs and they're meant to pump blood so they actually have to make contact with the ground Mm-hmm. Once they start making contact with the ground, the horse is then able to feel what's going on in his hoof. And in some instances, what's going on is not very comfortable. 
Mm, um, yeah. So you can mask that by nailing metal shoes onto their feet and, and then they don't feel whatever is going on. But, I mean, it's still going on. Or there's a transition period where they feel what's going on and maybe they're verging on navicular or laminitis or something. The whole thing is put boots on, give them sole protection, and get them moving because the more they move, the more the blood circulates. And blood has nutrients in it, which will facilitate the transition process. So I remember my horse like 10 years ago, um, and she, you know, she had a lot of damage. If I hadn't pulled the shoes, I mean, she was a six-year-old. Um, boy, I don't even know if she'd be around today. Um, mm. So, I mean, she would definitely would have been diagnosed navicular with pads and bar shoes and all that by the time she yeah. was 12. So there I was hand walking her up and down the street, you know, trying to get her hoof conditioned. And then as soon as you pop boots on, they have this comfort and off they go. So mm. the boots are meant not only for transition, but also when you get on and ride and push that sole further in. So here's the thing. There may be a couple of days where your horse seems a little uncomfortable, but it really doesn't have to last any longer than a few days, even in the worst case scenario particularly when you have soil protection on because, you know, no hoof, no horse. They want to move. They want to get well. And they'll do intrinsically. Their body has this intrinsic ability to heal. They'll do what they need to do. And in some cases, that requires a lot of movement. And they'll move on those sore hooves even? Is it like like biting down on on a sore tooth where, you know, we've got that instinct to kind of work through that problem? I think that's part of it. And then also with movement comes the endorphins, you know, the blood blood pumping, the feel-good factor. You know, in a natural Mm -hmm. environment, horses would move like up to 40 miles a day. Yeah, yeah. Food and running with the herd. So it's their natural composition to move. And when they can do that and exercise this level of comfort, and, of course, the more they move, the more comfortable they're going to get. And when Mm -hmm. they realize they've got soil protection on their hoofs, they tend to move more. You know how sometimes you see, well, people will pull the shoes off a horse and the horse will go stand on a grassy knoll and just stand there. You know, he doesn't want to move because now he can feel his feet and it doesn't feel great. But you put boots on and off he goes. Kicking yeah. his heels, having a fabulous time. So yeah, yeah. And, and is there any domestic, yeah. Debbie? You know, we can't mistake they, the yes, fact that they're true. domestic. Yeah, we yeah we are yeah th- we don't all have the privilege of working with those mustangs straight off the reservation, do we? Oh. No, it's true, it's true, and and I do I think that they won't harm themselves too. I think a lot of people have to trust horses a little bit more to make mm-hmm. good decisions for themselves too. Oh that they'll you know, yeah. yeah right. Well, they, we have wrap to them up. Anyway. It's like we we want to wrap them up and in some cases you know wrap them up into cellophane and put them in yeah, a box bubble wrap. You know, (laughs) bubble wrap. No, don't hurt yourself. (laughs) You know, when they're interacting with each other and maybe taking a little bang and a nip here and there, they are the happiest in the world because that team, herd, interactive community life environment is is what they know and love, and that and that builds the happiness hormone, (laughs) happiness molecule. You know, endorphin, natural endorphin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah. Now, and do they ever, do you think they, I look in their eyes a lot when, when you're mm. looking for reaction to, to anything yes. that you've invi- invented for them to be tortured by, but do they, do they ever feel funny about putting those boots on for the first time and flinging their feet around? Is it ever, do you see them go, what the heck have you done to me? Oh, those infinite pools, their eyes, isn't it? <laughs> like, did you, did you just look at them forever? Those big bulbous eyes. Yes. Um, Here's, here's what generally happens. Um, they, they, you know, they'll lift their foot, you'll put the boot on, and they'll go, hmm, this is interesting. And they'll take a couple <laughs> of high steps to determine the parameter, you know, because, of course, the hoof is pretty important. Um, if it's compromised um, in nature, they generally die. So um, so the hoof is, is really important to them, and they, they'll take these high steps, and then inevitably 
the head goes down mm. and the tongue comes out and they start licking and chewing. Oh, I love yeah. that. I love that and adrenaline. The eyes look out. up at you and say, thank you. <laughs> it took you a while, but I'm really glad you got here. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> mm-hmm. Now I know Glenn, you, you do, um, driving, you're a driver and you've used boots on your horses in the carriage. It, is there any difference that you've noticed besides, you know, taking care of good, good feet? But well, um, yeah, I mean, that's part yeah. of, you know, we, I, we have been barefoot with our horses for a long time. Uh, Jennifer trail rides and, and I drive and, and part of where we go, we, we we're lucky enough to live in an equestrian community with 17 miles of trails and 17 miles of roads that with virtually no cars. So uh-huh. we can go so, forever, you know, uh, yeah, just nice. without leaving our community, which is perfect. But we we have we go barefoot, so you know you cannot take a pony out on the roads like that for that for hours on end without seventeen do, miles, yeah, yeah, without doing some damage to their feet. So that's why we use boots. <clears throat> and uh, boy, the the Cavallo boots are just the best I've ever used. They're so easy to put on. It just takes me seconds. I used to use a, a competitor's boot, and I used to dread it uh, because it was just such a They're pain. Awkward. Yeah, it was yeah. a pain. And these stay on, and the pony, you know, goes well. And the one thing that's nice about these boots is they're grippy. I don't get the pony slipping yeah. at all on the road like that. Um, so, and you know, they use boots like this for endurance, and uh, where they're going over. Rocks and wet areas, and and they're really made for all, all those kinds of uh, conditions, yeah. which is kind of nice. So yeah, I yeah. wouldn't you know I wouldn't drive them on the roads at a trot uh, for any period of time without the boots on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Glenn, that's a great point because what we really wanted to do is create a boot that was really easy to put on, and and so that you never had to feel like oh gosh I've got this other function I have to do and the whole tack up procedure. So well, it's just as easy as, as picking out the hoof. And really, especially you know. with driving, because we got more crap anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You have a lot you know, of stuff. We have the harness and the cart, and, you know, we got all that stuff. You guys put yeah. on a saddle and a bridle, and you're off. Uh, you know, we got all that crap to put on, and then yeah. you add that to it. And I know it sounds like a first-world problem, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but when, you, when you're limited on time and you're going, in some days it was the decision, oh, I don't feel like putting the boots on today, so I would just drive around the farm. We wouldn't go out on the road, because I didn't feel like fussing with those boots. <laughs> yeah, well, that'll work. Until you got your cavallos. <laughs> That's exactly how I got them and, and, and why I like them so much. And we even got extras. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, yeah, no, definitely well, like you it. Well, you know, I see a lot of people wanting, like, we, you know, we tend to all the horse shows, Equitana and Equine Affairs. And, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in a more natural program as opposed to people are starting to realize that nailing metal shoes onto their hoof not only restricts the function of the hoof, but then it refers stro- uh, shock back up the structure, you know. So right. you've got your anti-inflammatories and your all these uh, anti-painkillers and anti-swelling medication on the shelves of your tax store because our horses are getting sore, you know, with this... There's metal nailed to their feet. Another thing coming from the horse husband's point of view is it's cheaper this way. I'm always happy now. It costs us 50 bucks for our farrier to do the trims on the two horses. And then instead of 300 or $400. So we, you buy the boots once, you use them for you know a very long time, and then you, you save on every time the farrier comes out. I love that part. I know that's not the main reason for doing it, but I like that if part. That gets our husbands happy. That's Yeah, okay. that's right. <laughs> Sorry, well, I have to tell you, you know, and we do get uh, a lot of comments about vet bills, too, because, um, oh, you know, good. there are some complications involved with nailing metal onto a horse's feet, you know, and they can, that's where um, the naviculars and the laminitis can really start to er, originate. So, uh, you know, maybe less vet bills. If you turn your horses out together and they love hanging out together and they're barefoot, they're not going to hurt each other anywhere near as much as they would if they had metal shoes. That's so there's true. all these other extenuating things. But if you have a natural program, a more natural sort of holistic way to keep your horse, you can save on the pharmaceuticals, the painkillers, the anti-inflammatories, and the vet bells. Mm-hmm. Not Very to mention... Good. The farrier fee. <laughs> and the farriers do. That's right. And the, and the best thing is people are starting to focus on the feed. It's not just, oh, you know, get a farrier in here. They're, they're, you know, that means that you start thinking about 
uh, feeding for that, supplementing for that, all those yeah. things that keep a healthy horse and a healthy hoof. So yeah. it's all it's all a good focus. It, and as you said, no horse, no hoof, and everybody knows that one. But do we really yeah. have a plan for that? Which is great. I mean, it, it and Dad loves the, the the Velcro in your boots are incredible. Like we were talking about not flinging a, a you know boot off on the trail or anything. Dad thinks that you could actually pull trailers with your Velcro. <laughs> it is so, so strong. They stay on. And I think that so would be creative. my bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. But uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, putting them on, it's, it really is easy. But I think losing them is that for me, it would have been a bigger worry had I not you know, experienced your Velcro. So, um, nobody well, you wants know, to be out on that trail. Well, you know, maybe we could end with this, but what, you know, one of the things that we take a look at when, cause we talk to a lot of people here in the shows and a lot of different disciplines, but what really caught our attention and what, you know, convinced us that we should go barefoot was, uh, a majority of the endurance riders doing 50 to hundred mile rides with their horses, use boots and not shoes. Mm-hmm. That you tells go. you something, right? I mean, they're out there for 18, 20 hours in the saddle in a day, uh, and they're doing that? Something, there's something to it. You know? Pay attention. Yeah. 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 That's right. Exactly. Over the worst right. terrain you could imagine mm-hmm. in many They cases. try, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, and there's yeah. another one, um, you know, because we have several mounted riders, uh, mounted posses and, and mounted um, police force units um, mm-hmm. using boots now, too, because of all the shock and concussion on a yeah. hard surface that those horses yeah. have to endure. And they find that at the end of the day, the horse is far less fatigued um, there's more traction uh, afforded them with the, the tread on the boot, um, and they just seem happier and work harder overall. So there's, there's that, too, that, that whole hard surface aspect, even if you're just um, patrolling a mall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. I mean, if you have to go to work with your horse and bring them inside, it's much better to have the boots on than the shoes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's a joke, people. That was a uh, joke. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, they don't have segues for horses yeah. yet, do they? Yes, right. no. <laughs> Put your slippers on. Pop in the mall. on. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carol, it's always fun to have you. It was really uh, fun. And you thank you, well. Glenn, for yep. joining us today, too. That was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I hope everybody will give this a try if they're kind of sitting on the fence about pulling those shoes, you know, just for a season. Give it a try, and I think your horses will smile. It'll be nice. And yeah. absolutely, like, do contact us because... Because um, we we have gr- the girls are sitting here waiting to help you through the process. So Jeez, we'll help okay. you with sizing. We'll help you with bidding. We'll help you with any of the concerns you might have. That's nice too. We'll put in the show notes your website. What's the phone number, Carol? Yeah, toll free is eight seven seven eight one eight zero zero three seven. Okay, and do you want to name the website too? Uh, Cavallo hyphen Inc. I N C. Next up, we have our trainer's tip from Katie Cunningham, who's an expat horse trainer from uh, England originally all the way to Guatemala. And she is reducing violence for horses and their training there. And she's going to talk to us about tricks for being 100% present with your horse. I would like to talk a little bit more about how we use our body when we're with our horse, um, more about observation of our body. I think that we can do more to prepare ourselves. If we're working with a a starter or a remedial horse, it's really important to be calm. And, and we do talk about, you know, moving slowly and what have you, but I like to take it a little bit further and really try and get my energy down or, or even I kind of try and send it down to the ground, you know, and get my breathing, you know, really um, into my core diaphragm. Yeah, you do breathing. the diaphragmatic breathing. That's right. right. Real deep. Real okay. deep. Um, mm-hmm. And then I really try to get present with my horse. So I feel that if you're there 100% with your horse, and I literally say it out loud, I say, I see you and I'm here and I'm here with you, then I feel like a lot of the problems are answered for you. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes we've got issues going on, but actually we're just not 100% focused on what's going on. And so we don't see what needs to be done. And if we're with our horse 100%, whether you're ridden or on the ground. So if I'm riding a dressage horse or show jumping or what have you, 
and I'm and I literally say out loud because I tend to forget mm -hmm. you, you know because we have a ha we all have a habit of thinking what are we going to have for supper or what have you uh -huh. and I so I literally do look down to the horse and say I'm I'm here with you I see you I'm right here with you then your whole sense you can feel things going on so much more um, physically but also you're just right there with your horse and the and and then everything else slips away. And I also think that's one of the, um, the secrets and the joys of join up and the success of join up is that when participants, particularly the kind of people that I work with, go into the round pen, it's maybe what the only time in their life that they've been 100% present, like really, really focused because it's so intense for them. Mm -hmm. And that's why the information is just absorbed so intrinsically. Mm -hmm. And not, you know, because mm -hmm. half the time humans tend to go around thinking of, of 10 things at the same yeah. time. Mm -hmm. But we need to give what we're doing 100% attention and then most of our problems will be answered. That's excellent. Right? Excellent. So they're reading, the horses are reading your intent and yeah. you're creating an intention that is focused just on them. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. It's a beautiful tip. Yeah. It's a great, that's Well, a great it's not very technical, but I think that it applies to every situation, yeah? Anytime you get around a horse? Yeah. No, that's brilliant. It's not discipline specific. It's right. horse specific. Exactly. I like yeah. That. Thanks, Katie. Okay, my pleasure. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, in Germany. He's up next in Germany, uh, April 6, 17, and 19. And then uh, he is spending this weekend, this will have just happened, uh, 11, 12 in Hungary, yes, he's in Eastern Europe, and he's doing a, a special training there with all of his certified instructors in that area. Then he hops over to Melbourne, Australia, where he'll be there on April 25 and 26, and then in Shepparton, Australia, April 29, and lastly, he spends a weekend in Canberra in Australia, May 2 and 3. Then he trots back home to meet up with all of his certified instructors at the uh, conference in mid-May. So catch all of his information here, Glenn. More details at MontyRoberts.com, all of Monty's calendar, or you can give them a call at 805-688-6288. And of course, for details about today's show, go to HorsemanshipRadio.com, where you can find links, photos, and more information about our guests. And as always, we love your feedback. Please follow us on Facebook under Facebook.com slash MontyRoberts and Twitter at Twitter.com. And to get the free app, go to Horse Radio Network on iTunes or Android. It's free, it's easy to download, and the Horsemanship Radio Show is one of eight different shows on the app. That's amazing. And many thanks to our sponsors, too. Couldn't do it without you. Be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. 